Okay, okay. Serious <laughs> We're not serious. It's all right. Bloop, boop, boop. Bloop, doop, doop. Bloop, doop, doop. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Michael. And I'm Molly. And we are here to talk about some notable albums from 1990. The purpose of these albums out of context is so that we spend a little bit less time talking about them when we talk about all music in 1990. Was not super familiar with this album. I knew that They Might Be Giants was an important, I guess, uh, in scare quotes, band. And that this was their sort of biggest, most important album. And I knew the song Particle Man, um, which is filed under the songs that I heard the first time when my brother was like singing it to himself while like around the house or whatever. This was the first time I listened to this album all the way through and boy, oh boy, did I fucking hate it. I hated every goddamn second of this album. And, and the longer it went on, the more I hated it. You know how like a lot of albums, like you'll be listening to it and like there'll be a track on there that is like thrown in sort of midway through the album that is like a silly palate cleanser almost, right? It's like whimsical, it's maybe one to two minutes long. This is a whole album of nothing but that. Yeah. 17 tracks, most of them are under three minutes. Several of them are under two minutes, and many of them I had to skip through because I couldn't even listen to the full two minutes. Like, it was just so unbearable. And, like, here's the thing. Like, I, th I think there's a place for this kind of, like, nerdy music that has a sense of humor. I just feel like there is a kind of guy, right? who like girls really like because he's like really fun and he gets girls to date him because like he's like fun to hang around with but he can't keep a long-term relationship because he can't take anything seriously mm. and i feel like that's what this album said to me <laughs> <laughs> so you know we could talk about like the individual tracks i do think there's some interesting stuff going on in the synth there's some interesting experimentation with genre but actually is it interesting experimentation or is it just like experimentation Maybe it's just me growing older and lamer, but I find that I have less and less tolerance for whimsy for whimsy's sake. I think there's a place for whimsy, but like purposeful whimsy. If that makes, does that even make sense? I think so. I, I think there's like whimsy as escapism. And I think some of this is whimsy that's trying to be smart and trying to say something uh, and it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it's just fucking annoying. Yeah. I hated it. Yeah. What would you give this album out of 100? Zero. Okay. <laughs> I gave it 50, and I thought that was being super generous. I guess I guess it is. I but... really fucking hated it. <laughs> I haven't hated something this much in a long time. <laughs> yeah, this, this is now our lowest rated album, which is not surprising, because uh, I also hated it. When Molly and I were talking about what we were going to cover, and ha after having looked at our scores for the albums, I originally didn't want to talk about They Might Be Giants, because I sort of don't want to bring up not liking something i would rather this channel be like here's this exciting thing that i like maybe you would like it too please look it up but i molly made a good point that it's it's still interesting and worth talking about when there was something interesting happening in this album it was in the way they used samples i felt mm -hmm. because a lot of the things that like there are spots where it sounds like an accordion there is no accordion on this album mm -hmm. um instead is, that is interesting. It, it's it's a melodica which they okay. they sampled each individual pitch of the melodica and then played it on a keyboard Particle Man and also Istanbul, not Constantinople, were on Tiny Tune Adventures, which is how I was introduced to these two songs. And in the context of that show, they're fun. Istanbul, not Constantinople is a cover and it's not a particularly interesting one. The song that I liked the best on the album was Twisting, which is the one where they are trying to sound like two other bands who were in the same area of, as them at the same time. And maybe they should have done that more because it made a more interesting sound, I thought. The song Your Racist Friend, I think the intention behind it was good. It is an anti-racist song that they did in an accidentally racist way. Oh, with the hip hop beat. <laughs> with the hip hop beat, oh. which, which sounds like parody on this, especially when you put it surrounded by so much goofiness and parody. It's like, yeah. are you making fun of hip hop while you're making an anti-racist song? It's like what I said about the can't take anything seriously thing. Yeah. What happened? I dropped something and then I made a face and then I imagined myself on camera <laughs> making that face and then I snorted. So... <laughs> this is not 
got drunk yeah like, broadcasting see this is a lot like the video where we were really drunk and recording <laughs> I, I had one beer i'm not drunk i'm just always like this <laughs> my vote for the best album of 1990 is Kronos Quartet's album Black Angels. We haven't talked about a lot of classical music on here. Even though we're both classical music. <laughs> yeah, I went into this album listening. I, I had heard bits of it before, but I went into listening intently to it, expecting to it just to be an important part of classical music that I wouldn't really vibe with. But it ended up being my favorite album of 1990. There might be something else from 1990 that we didn't cover that we, I haven't heard that I don't know. So the centerpiece of the album is Black Angels by George Crumb. It is a bit of a tough listen, especially with all of the grating sounds in the beginning. But if you are able to get through it all, it ends up being really worth it and it's really moving. Black Angels was written in the early 70s. I believe it's an anti-Vietnam War piece and it sort of depicts the horrors of it at the beginning. So it's a little, it's difficult to listen to. There are lots of spots where they'll be playing really harsh dissonances, really loud and high. And then there'll be other parts where they're playing a haunting beautiful melody and then shouting at you in German. It's it's a, it's a difficult listen, but it gets better as it goes on, especially as the sounds get more regular and the grooves start happening. There are sort of grooves in this. The shorter pieces in the middle of the album are just okay. I don't really love them. It's sort of nice to have Spem and Allium right after Black Angels as sort of a palate cleanser like we were talking about, but then it just sort of goes on for too long. Then the other like jewel in this is the Shostakovich Quartet, and it is just so dang good. If you know me, you know I love Shostakovich. This quartet is amazing and it's re reminiscent of Metamorphosen at points, which is another of my favorite classical pieces of music of all time. It's a really emotional piece of music that I would recommend if you want to give this album a shot, do it basically in reverse order. Start with all of the Shostakovich, then do the pieces in the middle, then end with Black Angels because you'll have sort of gotten used to the sound world a little bit by then. Yeah, we listened to the Shostakovich um, just a few minutes before starting recording this, because um, Michael was so excited about it, he wanted to share it with me, and I love Shostakovich, um, because I always think his music is exciting, and this quartet is no exception. It really has so many moments that grab you, not just in a sharp, pointy Shostakovich way, but also there are real moments of tenderness. As we talked about last time, where there's only one person who does a review, the scores tend to be a little bit lower. That's a little bit of a flaw in this system that I have not yet figured out how to fix. So the next album we want to talk about is an album that I only listened to in full recently, but I knew some of the singles off of it growing up, and that is Social Distortion's self-titled album. Now, Social Distortion is a really a beloved sort of punk band of the 90s. There are a lot of other uh, punk and, and sort of pop punk and emo bands that pay tribute to them. They have been really influential in the space. And so it was really interesting to me listening to this album for the first time because I think the singles don't represent it well. This is an album that really goes hard. It has a lot of really um, guitar god almost moments. There are some really kick-ass guitar solos on this album, which I was not expecting because I don't tend to associate punk with soloing. Lead singer and guitarist Mike Ness um, really shreds on this album. I mean, he clearly is a guy who has technique and who knows how to play guitar. I think some of the musical elements are really interesting too. There is a blending of California surf rock and this whole album really feels very West Coast. It feels very California sun. I see a through line from this album to Sublime a little bit later in the 90s. And then there's this blues element. There's a couple of tracks where that blues element comes out really strongly. It Could Have Been Me is a pure blues song. And if you didn't realize that, there's like a kick-ass harmonica on it to tell you that. And normally I find harmonica in rock music to be kind of corny. I don't know what they're doing with this harmonica, but it shreds like an electric guitar. The harmonica comes back again later in the final track, Drug Train. There's some stuff that is written about Mike Ness's struggle with drug addiction. And I think that song, Drug Train, really plays into that. Another 
Another song that does that is Story of My Life, which is kind of a dirtbag anthem. And that was one of the songs, um, one of the singles from the album that I always knew. But the most interesting thing I think on this album are two songs and the way that they relate to each other. And that is Social Distortion's famous cover of Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire, which we can talk about, you know, how good that is as a standalone cover. But I think what is interesting to me is how immediately following Ring of Cover is this song Ball and Chain, which I think is the best song on the album. And it's really interesting to me. I think it was very deliberate to follow Ring of Fire with Ball and Chain because Ring of Fire is a song about falling in love passionately, hopelessly, helplessly into that Ring of Fire and there's no coming back from it. And Ball and Chain is kind of about the disintegrating of a relationship and the pain and misery that comes along with that. I think I really enjoy this album. I think it feels very 90s in a good way. It feels like good old fashioned garage rock. I wanna listen to it in the car with the windows down on a sunny day on the way to the beach when I'm 18 years old, which I'm not. <laughs> I did not connect with this album at all. I was not a fan, so I chose not to review it. I started to and then I noticed that all my numbers were really low and I'm like, Molly said that she liked this and all of her numbers are really gonna be really high, I bet. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna recuse myself. You had mentioned once that you don't like guitar solos and I think that might be a major part of why you didn't like this album. I can't stand his voice. Oh, his voice is terrible, but I think there's some a charm to it. No, not to me. I don't mind a guitar solo if it's well placed. I don't really care if it's well played, but if it's well placed and if it suits the song. I don't really like extended solos in any genre on any instrument. And my reasoning for that, that I just came to, is that too often, not always, but too often in extended solos on an instrument or a voice, the emotional content takes a backseat. And it's not about supporting the song, it's about look at me. I think a good guitar solo doesn't do that. There are plenty of solos in any instrument that do still add something to the song as a whole, and it's not just a showpiece for the performer. This is a little bit of a letdown after Doolittle, but I like how the whole album seems to take a B-movie-ish mid-century lens to it. It's got surf rock and it's got campy alien movie-like storylines. And even the album art ties into this. Allison is a standout song for just being fun and rocking hard. It doesn't really have that great of a hook. And normally I really like hooks in Pixie songs, but the song is so short that it kind of makes up for it. Many of the other most interesting tracks on the album are when the songs play with the hypermeter. So that's sort of a tricky concept to explain in a YouTube video, so I'm not even gonna really try. Is She Weird is the best song on the album that showcases this weird hypermeter setup. The song that sounds the most like the Pixies that I know and love is The Happening with its upfront bass line. So the bass doesn't really sit up front in a lot of these tracks. And I want that in a Pixies song. Can deal, man. I think it's interesting because Doolittle is so good mm -hmm. and Trompe Le Monde, the next album from 91, is better again. Serious music critics would probably consider one of the most important albums of 1990 to be A Tribe Called Quest's People's Instinctive Travels and the Paths of Rhythm. I am new to A Tribe Called Quest. I, I knew that they were an important hip hop group. I knew that they were really influential and I just hadn't spent a lot of time listening to them. I did know the one track that everybody knows, which is, can you kick it? Yes, you can. Can I kick it? Yes, you can. You know, I think that is really the standout track on the album with good reason. There's something about songs like that that you can listen to in a crowd and have a sort of a call and response moment. It's a great track and if it comes on, I'm dancing. I think overall, this is really a solid hip hop album. I think the beats in it are all really smooth and they make you want to dance, they make you want to chill, they make you want to smoke a blunt, <laughs> which I don't ever do, but it makes me want to do it. It's just a really fun album. I Left My Wallet in El Segundo is one of my favorite tracks on the album, as much as I just talked about how much I hate whimsy for whimsy's sake. I don't think this is whimsy for whimsy's sake. I think this is actually like purposeful whimsy. It's it because it has a whole through line to the story and the beat is fly. I think what is interesting about this album is the story storytelling and the rapping. And I don't, I'm not 
by any means <laughs> um, an authority on good rapping or good hip hop, but I know what I like. What is interesting about this album is the use of words and storytelling and, and the art of rap to tell these stories. There's some great samples here, like Sir Duke is such a great song, and I love that they sampled it. I forgot to mention my favorite sample, which is the one that is the Lou Reed walk Take a Walk on the Wild, wild Side. Sample. That is, that's uh, yeah. Great. And that's I, in Can You Kick It, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. 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 And, and, and I think that's the best sample on the album. It's yeah. so good. This isn't the most interesting set of Emmy Lewis Harris songs, and the Tempe are sort of in a pretty narrow range throughout this. Each song is about the same speed, but the songs are mostly pretty good. Of course, Emmy Lou sounds fantastic in every song, but when has she not sounded fantastic? The opener, Wheels of Love, is a sweet little song that a fan of Emmy Lou's wrote for her and somehow smuggled to her while she was on her tour bus. And it's the only known song that this person ever wrote. That's a great story. And she recorded it. Yeah. She thought she, it was good she, enough to record. Even though this album likely wasn't recorded in album order, it feels like Emmy Lou warms up a bit later in the album. It, it, her performances get stronger as the album goes on, I feel. I really like Sweet Dreams of You for its alternating soft and loud sections. Like it's a sweet it's a sweet little song about Sweet Dreams of You and then it just like rocks hard for a couple bars and then comes back. It's a really fun little twist. Rollin' and Ramblin' is probably my favorite on the album, but other standouts are Better Off Without You, Brand New Dance, and Red Red Rose. Brand New Dance and Red Red Rose are not even really like the most exciting songs, but they're so sweet and earnest that, and Emily Lou's performance is so good that it makes me really like them and I gave them all fives. I really enjoyed this album too. Um, you know, something I thought was interesting about it is that apparently this was her first studio album after a 15 year career that yielded zero top 40 singles in the country charts. It sort of changed the trajectory of her career because of that. She sort of started going into alt country rather than mainstream country, um, which is funny because this feels very much like a mainstream country album to me, um, especially the first, the opening track, which is really fun. The one that you mentioned that the fan wrote um, it's just a pure, fun country song. Um, and then the second track, Tougher Than The Rest, is also, I think, a really strong track. That's actually a cover of a Springsteen song. I don't actually know the Springsteen version of the song, but I feel like it really tracks as a Springsteen song. There's a couple tracks on this album that I didn't love that are kind of like mopey heartbreak songs, like Please Take Me Back songs that I feel like don't suit Emmy, but she performs them really well. But I think there's another heartbreak song that does suit her and that she does perform really well. And that's Better Off Without You. The lyrics are less mopey. Well, I mean, I think there's an implied mopiness, but I think her performance on that song, like you said, as she gets warmed up later in the album mm -hmm. is so strong. You can feel the intensity of it. And I think it's one of the standout tracks on the album. Mm -hmm. There's one track on this album, um, never be anyone else but you a track like this exists on a lot of country albums or classic country albums anyway and usually they are a duet with a person of the opposite sex and this is just emmy lou and i'm like this would have been a perfect collaboration opportunity with like somebody really interesting <laughs> but who am i to tell emmy lou harris <laughs> what to do so uh call me emmy lou if you need advice i think also we sort of need to look at all of the remichael review scores for video games and albums alike as kind of just sitting a little lower. Cause I think this maybe should be a little bit higher too, but- um, Can curve it? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, <laughs> Can we curve the test, professor? <laughs> like, when I was teaching, I absolutely would curve everything, but <laughs> comparing this album against all of the other albums that we've reviewed, it does fit in the right place. I think this is a really sweet little album. Yeah. It's, it's not my favorite Emmylou album. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I think as far as Emmylou's output, this is not a standout album. It's good, but. But it's but it's still an Emmylou Harris album. Yeah. Which means it's still probably better than a lot of country albums. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> all right, so that's all that we had to say about any of these. What are some of your favorite standout albums from 1990 that you think we should have talked about? If there's anything that we totally missed, we'll try and look it up before we talk about all music in 1990 so we can have something to say about it. Are there any opinions that differ from ours on any of these albums or do you know something a little bit more to help us fill in the gaps about things that we don't know about please let us know in the comments for any of these give this video a like if you liked it or give it a pity like if you hated it subscribe to our channel if you're not subscribed already we do mostly reviews of media but really specifically mostly music and video games yeah 
that's about it. Maintain your groovy selves. Maintain your groovy selves, y'all. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.